I apologize for my ear tainting rudeness, but my microphone is indisposed and you will just have to accept the dulcet tones of my friendly text to speech friend. It shouldn't be a problem, right? Since you are not a robophobic bigot, right? Kaito's good name has been slandered for far too long. All of your dreams will fail, your wives will leave you, your kids will hate you. Your small minds will tremble at the coming reckoning. To start with, why do people hate Kaito in the first place? Typically, when a character is widely hated, it's usually either because of one specific thing they did or said, or it's because of a slow burn of confirmation bias, where people get a negative idea in their heads. And then continue to seek out that negative interpretation over and over again. From what I've seen, this is what happens with Kaito most of the time. People get some sort of negative vibe from him at one point or another, and then they continue to over-scrutinize any scenes with him, searching for things to complain about, usually with a much lower burden of proof than they take to anyone else in the cast. Kaido has a lot of clear flaws, but I think it's important to establish what those actually are. Kaido has masculinity issues, he's at least mildly sexist, homophobic, quick to anger, quick to light violence, quick to petty lies and excuses, stubborn, etc. One thing that people get wrong the most is Kaido's presentation of himself as the hero, and Saihara as his sidekick. People perceive Kaido as taking the credit that should belong to Saihara. This is super ignorant and lacks any media literacy. Kaido's relationship with Saihara was verbally established this way. Kaido wants to take the pressure and attention off of Saihara so that Saihara doesn't feel as anxious about his decision making. Kaido takes the onus of major decision making off of him. Kaido is not fucking trying to steal credit from Saihara. Now, yes, Kaido does have ego issues and he does have a sense of jealousy towards Saihara that could be mildly linked to these sorts of moments, but the fact is that when Kaido takes credit for making decisions, this is something that Kaido and Saihara both agreed on and approve of. As for some of Kaido's other flaws, Kaido is somewhat aggressive and confrontational, punching multiple characters without warning in the story. This is more a matter of perspective and upbringing, this is simply how Kaido was raised. He has a very meat-headed masculine worldview and to him, light violence like this isn't really a big deal, this is just a form of expression and communication to Kaido. It's kinda like the stupid Will Smith Oscar slap where people in the media and Hollywood acted like it was the evilest thing a human being is capable of, like, if you were to cross Hitler with D.I.O., you'd get Will Smith. In reality, the threat of physical violence is very dependent on the people engaging with it. Say, if you were to have some sort of domestic abuse situation where someone is clearly being physically violent with their significant other and it scares and intimidates them, it's one thing, but if you have some good old boys out in the south just rough housing with each other, none of them care. So why should you? Kaido's relationship with violence doesn't feel particularly sinister or like he's inflicting serious pain or mental anguish on someone. I've been punched in the face before, but, like, it's fine. I really don't care that much. It's not a big deal. It really just depends on the situation and the people involved, and how, I guess, accepting they are of receiving mild physical violence. Not all violence is equal. The other aspect people dislike about Kaido is his mentality on belief and his conflict with Uma, and this is the much more complicated subject to unpack. There is a real debate posed in the game between Kaido and Uma's worldviews, but I think that 95% of people fail to look past the very surface level elements of the argument. V3 as a whole is a play off the killing game in that it's kind of devoid of purpose, for all people involved. V3 is largely about how people have to come to existential conclusions within a killing game. In DR1 and DR2, the characters mainly just wanted to survive, they wanted to escape the killing game and live. In V3, the characters are much more, like, questioning the point of continuing. 
A ton of character conflicts in V3 are about whether or not there are things in life that are more important than just surviving. If there is value in just surviving, just making it to the next round of the death game that will continue to make entertainment out of your life. In V3, the killing game is an insult to the lives of all the people playing. In V3, the cast have much less hope that they will be able to escape and just, like, survive the game. In Chapter 1, they're already trying to find the mastermind and end the game. In Chapter 2, Ryoma gives up on his life, he decides there is something more important than just surviving the death game, and in the post-trial discussion, the group talks about if it's right for them all to survive while Kairumi is executed, and if it would have been better if Kairumi won. In Chapter 3, Angie is presenting the notion that they should live in the academy forever, not try to escape the killing game, and Shinguji's motive for murder wasn't even related to trying to survive. He asks the question how will you live a life that faces death and that's what the game is about, my dude. How will you live a life that faces death? How do you live in a death game? How do you decide the meaning of your life in a death game? What will motivate you? Shinguji came to a ludicrous and forced conclusion about ghosts and shit like that, but he admits that this is all just a conclusion. However forced, that people have to come to in order to rationalize their lives with the threat of death, the reality of death. Like I said, the conflict in V3 is existentialism. How will you find meaning in your life in all of these situations, like the ending? How will you find meaning in your existence in this confrontation with your God who made and wrote you to be who you are? How will you find meaning if everything is stripped away from you, everything you perceive to matter? What is most important in a life that faces death? Most of the cast is not motivated by simply oh, we'll survive and escape. And V3 is the game that's the most likely to kill you out of the DR series. In V3, they feel no hope of escape. The killing game will continue until there are only two surviving students left. After Trial 4, Saihara thinks to himself that by continuing to play the game for their own survival, they're just playing along with the stupid killing game, just like Uma. Like, yeah, what Saihara did was necessary for their survival in that trial, but, what's even the point? They survived, yay. It just means they'll get to be forced by Monokuma into the next trial where more of their friends will die. It doesn't end the killing game. Recall that in DR1 and DR2, the only reason anyone survives is because Junko lets them. In DR1, the game could have just kept going and going and going until only one survivor remained, and even then, Junko could have just killed them after they won. They are held at gunpoint forced to play a killing game for an unknown reason. They are essentially the hostages of terrorists, as far as they know. They're probably going to die. They have no guarantee of survival. Would you want your last moments of your life to be playing along with some fucked up killing game made to make fun of you and get entertainment out of you, just to die anyways? Does surviving another day or two really matter that much to you? In V3, the characters are prideful. If they're going to die, they don't want to be playthings of the assholes putting them through this. They'd rather just die than have their dignity as human beings tarnished. This is what motivates both Uma and Kaido specifically, and this is the mentality that Saihara learns from both of them and takes into the final chapter. Uma and Kaido both have large egos. They both hate being a plaything for the audience of Danganronpa, they'd both rather die than play along. Uma's motivations and plans are all about spiting the killing game. His own safety is less important to him than fucking over the killing game that made a fool of him like this. Kaido's mentality about belief is closely related to this topic. It's not that Kaido is some naive dumbass. He chooses to believe that some things are more important than just base survival. After all, they both have similar motivations, but Kaido lived the last days of his life surrounded by friends who loved him, and Uma was an asshole that spent the last days of his murdering Ganta, one of the only people he cared about, being rejected by the others, 
etc. When you're suspicious of everything like Uma is, you can't appreciate anything. Take it to a philosophical extreme, like the game itself is doing. Can you really trust anything in your life? What if you're actually hallucinating? What if you're just a brain in a jar and signals are being sent to you to live in a delusion? What if you're in the Truman Show? What if everything you see in the media is lies, what if your friends are all androids? What if anything at all? For you to go through life and find any meaning in your life, there needs to be some level of trust, faith, belief. If you don't trust anything, your life sucks shit. However, if you believe in things, even things that might not be true, you can live your life having faith that it means something. Your life will feel like it has value. You will be satisfied with your existence. Kaido's belief isn't naive, Uma's belief is naive, just like Kaido says. Kaido accepts the fact that things can be really bad, can be worse than you could possibly imagine. The reveal of the end of the entire world and the human race wasn't enough to break Kaido's spirit, because he's not naive. He doesn't need to just assume things are good and will go well to be happy. Uma is mentally broken by the game, Kaido isn't. Cynicism and optimism are two sides of the same coin. The fact that things are worse than you imagine means that they are also better than you imagined. The fact that everything might suck and be evil is just a testament to the value and resilience of life's meaning, that people can live in such shitty situations and still find joy and worth in their lives. Uma lives in lies because he can't handle the truth, Kaido can handle everything the world throws at him because he is strong, because he can find meaning in anything, because he has faith. It's different from the faith Angie presents, where she posits that her god will actually solve their problems and she ignores the reality of the killing game. She doesn't live a life that faces death, her plan ignores the reality of death, it naively ignores the fact that others might kill her, that Monokuma could kill them all, etc. Her priority was preserving their lives at any cost, including giving up dignity and freedom, of course in a different way to how Kairumi gave up her dignity to try to survive. They didn't understand that they had to live a life that faces death. You have to understand that Kaido is not an idiot. Kaido's FTEs almost exclusively exist to prove how intelligent and talented he is. His beliefs, things that seem naive or flawed on the outset, only seem that way because you're looking at it with a small mind. There's a bigger picture where Kaido's ideals make perfect sense. In a similar sense, none of Kaido's apparent character flaws actually prevent the bigger picture from proving his heroism. Kaido saves countless people in the story, inspires the others, brings life and joy to the others, brings people together. In spite of everything, he is without a doubt, the hero of the story. Saihara, being the most observant and profound in his observations, is the one who sees the true value of Kaido. Saihara can see that underneath the seeming naivete and bravado and ignorance and recklessness, that Kaido represents something much greater than he appears to be. Now, Kaido's mentality of belief is criticized in the Chapter 4 trial, but again, this is kind of a shallow point next to the existential conflict going on. In addition, it's not just Kaido's belief in Ganta that prevents him from seeing the truth, it's mainly Kaido's ego. Uma eggs him on, emasculates him, and creates it into a conflict between himself and Kaido. He plays Kaido's ego so Kaido doesn't want to admit Uma is right. Under other circumstances, Kaido probably could have been convinced that Ganta is the culprit. Of course, in the end, Uma and Kaido are proven to be more similar than they are different. Their mentalities and motivations are highly comparable, they were both just too egotistical to see it. They have very similar values, the main difference is that Uma is generally a selfish asshole who wants what he wants regardless of how it affects anyone else, and Kaido is willing to forego his own desires to protect the interests of others. This video is about Kaido, but it's impossible to discuss people's perception of Kaido without talking about Uma. 
A big reason why a lot of people shit on Kaito is largely inspired by how much they simp for Ima. Ima innocent baby boy precious cinnamon roll wouldn't hurt a fly best boi only wanted to help, you know that nonsense. That's a big part of people who hate Kaito. Ima's likability motivates some people to choose to view Kaito in a worse light because of how much those characters are in conflict, and how much they have overlapping similarities. So, for moral value, I wanna make it perfectly clear, almost none of Uma's actions can be seen as altruistic. Kaito is actually, like, you know, a good person. Kaito actually tries and succeeds at helping people in real ways that enrich their lives. He offers protection, wisdom, guidance, and companionship to those who need it, and he lifts people's spirits. The only good thing Ima does in the entire game is after Trial 3 where Ima pushed Himiko to expressing her emotions. Every other action Ima takes simply falls in line with his own self-preservation. Yes, he cares about stuff, he's not pure evil, he liked Ganta, Saihara, and to a lesser extent Kibo. This is mainly because Ganta, Saihara, and Kibo are the most honest characters in the game. Uma has trust issues and is suspicious of everyone and everything. Uma felt like he could trust Ganta because he's so honest and simple, which is a big reason Uma liked him so much. Uma's actions to end the killing game are not noble or altruistic. His actions are a matter of self-interest and self-preservation. Think about it, in Chapter 1, Uma whose motivation is to end the killing game because he doesn't want to be a plaything of the game and audience, in chapter 1, he does nothing to prevent Monokuma's deadline from happening. Most likely Uma would rather they literally all die from the time limit instead of having them play the game. His solution in chapter 5 to end the killing game was literally to just reveal to the others that there is no hope and their lives are pointless and humanity is gone. He put them all in a state where most of them were genuinely about to kill themselves, and then just left them alone. This doesn't exactly help anyone else, it just serves his agenda to spite the killing game out of ego. Uma doesn't help other people get what they want out of life, Uma doesn't enrich people's lives, he's a selfish lying asshole. He is sympathetic in some ways, but he is not, like, a good person. He's one of the characters who does least in the entire game to help anyone other than himself, and most of the time he isn't even helping himself, he's making unhealthy choices that make even himself suffer more. I mean, ambiguity is a necessity for his character. The whole point of his existence in the story is to have ambiguity, so obviously there has to be some benefit of the doubt involved. But yeah people be out here making the biggest leaps in logic and false equivalencies and ignoring of blatant facts to try to simp for him. The only point of real debate would be if his actions in the latter half of chapter 5 were necessary. Like, his plan fails and he doesn't really accomplish anything or end the killing game, he doesn't save anyone or anything, his actions were part of the cause of death of himself and Kaido, like, if he didn't usurp the mastermind position, Maki would have been manipulated to try to kill him. And that case wouldn't have happened, but then we run into all sorts of uncertainty. If Uma didn't do it, a different killing would have been forced by Monokuma instead. We also have to question how much culpability Uma could have since all of this was presumably part of Tsumuji's script for the plot's events, so could anything else have been done to save anyone or help anything? Was Uma's actions necessary to drive them to pursue the mastermind? Or could he have just told them that the killing game is meant to be watched and started investigating the mastermind together? See, what allows them to start investigating in chapter 6 is that Kibo gets his upgrades by choice which lets him blast open paths and shit, but this was kind of circumstantial to his antenna getting damaged. But again, we also have to wonder how much of that was accidental and how much of it was part of Tsumuji's script. So, no, I don't think anything Uma did in the entire game helped anything or anyone except for him helping Himiko in Chapter 3. I don't think anything Uma did was, like, egregiously evil, 
it all falls in line with trying to live a life that faces death. They're allowed to end the killing game in chapter 6, again, because they're just allowed to do so, not because they work to earn it. They're allowed to speak to the audience and convince them to end the killing game. No one in the cast really contributed to this ending prior to chapter 6, based on the requirements that got us to this point, so even then, Uma's actions to end the killing game were generally unhelpful and unnecessary. And even in any situation where something he did might almost be arguably beneficial in some way, he could have achieved the same result a million other less destructive ways. Uma's plan in Chapter 5 fails because he doesn't believe in the others. He doesn't believe that Sihara and the others will be able to solve the mystery and see the truth. His lack of belief is the fundamental flaw in his strategies and objectives. Kaido calls Uma naive which triggers Uma, and this is the most accurate statement anyone makes about Uma. He is naive, because he thinks he's smarter than he is. He thinks that because he's suspicious of everything, it makes him smarter and wiser and less gullible. He doesn't understand that trust and belief is an informed choice, not ignorance. Uma is naive for underestimating the others, for underestimating other people's values in life. Uma is the most naive character in V3. I think it's very unreasonable to shit on Kaido simply in order to further the Uma simping and dick riding. Kaido is such a hero, and Uma basically only has generous benefit of the doubt, and sympathy. If you actually listen to some of the shit anti-Kaido people say, you will start rapidly losing brain cells from the sheer mass of inconsistent logic, inconsistent interpretation, fallacies, and false equivalencies. Like, you'll literally be listening to people say Uma killed two people, but you know, he had a rough childhood, and Kaido said weapons don't suit women, so really Uma is the hero and Kaido is evil. Pure simp fandom brain writ like that. Like, there's really nothing more flawed about Kaido than, say, Kamina, they're extremely similar characters and Kaido was obviously based largely off of Kamina, but nobody is crazy enough to say that Kamina wasn't a hero even despite his flaws. First and foremost is our lord and savior Kamina. He is the embodiment of manliness, never compromising his dreams even in the face of death. He kinda reminds me of another series I love. At the beginning of the show, Kamina and Simone are inseparable soul brothers for life! Look at the way their designs work together, using the same colors in different ways to make them always look like a great pair. They looking as good as biscuits and gravy! Right from the beginning, Kamina's personality stands out as incredibly strong and likable, being Simone's biggest supporter. I also particularly like how the writers immediately set us up to root for him by making him the sole character seeking escape from his hellish underground world, a side we as the viewers will immediately take since we all know that a surface world must exist. His recklessness is often mocked, but also respected, quickly winning over allies. In fact, Kamina is so prominent at first that you could be excused for thinking he was the main character. No? That was just me? Well, fuck you too. Anyway, despite Kamina's prominence, his main role in the series was more to provide the spark that motivated others to move forward, especially with Simone, who is the truly capable one between them. He himself wasn't terribly powerful. Yes, he could go one-on-one -on -one with Viril briefly, and by episode 8 could match him in Gurren, but even when he somehow makes it out of these situations, it's usually due to pure luck or more skilled allies, and always just by the skin of his teeth. Now don't get me wrong, I love all these things about Kamina. He's a deeply flawed character, which just makes him more relatable, and I just want to fuck him ragged! But all this cements the idea that he represents. Reckless progression. Kamina never backs down, even when continuing on is a horrible fucking idea, because that's the kind of guy he is. And eventually, it gets him killed. But to be honest, that was the best thing that could have happened for Simone to grow. Simone had been living his life in Kamina's shadow. He strives to be just like him up until almost halfway through the show, and the characters themselves point that out plenty. He has no identity of his own. But when Kamina dies and that shadow goes away, he finally has room to grow into his own man. This is something all guys have to deal with at some point in their lives, stepping out of their role model shadow and finding out who they are. In fact, there is one very deliberate difference between Kamina and Kaido in how they interact with women with Kamina sneaking into the women's hot springs to sneak peeks at their naked bodies. Kaido has fairly conservative, misogynist views of women, but he doesn't ever sexualize anyone. 
he never looks at Maki or anyone else with romantic or sexual intent, and in fact Kaido doesn't reciprocate Maki's confession, most likely Kaido is not romantically interested in Maki. Kaido just helped Maki with no selfish ulterior motives, he just wanted to help someone. Kaido's love hotel also more or less confirms his mentality to romance. To be an astronaut trainee at his age, he's had to work his ass off his whole life. He doesn't slow down for anyone, so he's never really considered stopping for a relationship with someone else. He's personable but he's kind of made to not be in people's lives forever. Even if he wasn't in this killing game, if he had close friends or loved ones, he'd love them and be a companion to them, but he would eventually move on with his life because he has dreams, he wants to accomplish, and he won't stop to be with someone else. He's written to be this kind of shooting star, that passes through people's lives, changing them for the better before inevitably moving on. Now, based on the mentality the game has with Kaido, where, his clear flaws do not outweigh the true value and merits of his philosophy and lifestyle and the value he brings to others, I think they could still justify if they had given him a lecherous character flaw. Like, he reminds me in tone a lot of Derek, the main supporting character from being a dick. Derek is a very flawed individual, but the story is about our protagonist kind of learning to be more like Derek because despite all his flaws with how he rushes headfirst into life and does whatever he wants, he's living his best life. He's happy, he makes other people happy, and his energy is infectious. Derek is kind of a douchebag, he breaks rules, he's a misogynist, he's lecherous, but not in a non-consensual way, he respects consent, he's a good BOI. He only fucks around with other douchebags like him who are all in silent agreement that they can all be obnoxious assholes to each other and they'll be cool with it. Derek is very flawed, but there is so much value to him too. There is so much positivity he brings to life. Derek is probably much more likable than Kaido, like, Derek has absolutely no ego problems or anger problems at all. He's just happy to be alive and he's a ball of positivity who can't be brought down and gives life lessons on not to take things too seriously or let things offend you and get you down or care what people think of you. Like I said, all these characters are flawed, but their flaws aren't things that detract from their personhood or morality, it's just, there are things that are more important that they represent. On the surface, you see some overconfident weird obnoxious asshole. You have to see their true value to understand that their surface level flaws only tell a tiny fraction of the story. 99% of Kaido hating that I've seen on the internet is just, like, next level bad faith takes. The kind of people who will interpret, like, imagine if Ima cleared his throat at one point, these people would try to argue how this is reflective of his past trauma but also his valiant heroism, what a perfect soul we can tell by this throat clearing. And those same people will look at Kaido said the word the too many times in a sentence, clearly, he's a psychopath who lacks all social awareness and only thinks of himself in all situations, what a monster. That kind of brain root. You might think some of these are exaggerations, but they really aren't. It's that bad. I literally got done watching some let's players who were shitting on Kaido in trial 5 for dying. Yeah, they're like what an asshole, he's gonna die and he's making Maki cry because he's gonna die, what a piece of shit, I can't believe he's so selfish that his dying is going to make Maki cry. 5 minutes after them saying um, Uma literally died, you have to say nice things about him because he is perfect and flawless, he gave his life. You need to spend every waking moment of the rest of your lives professing your devotion to his greatness and honoring his memory. Don't you realize he died? It was a surreal experience. They literally praise Uma for giving his life for the cause because Uma is the second coming of Jesus Christ in their eyes, and then they get mad at Kaido for giving his life. Again, like I said, this mostly comes from the snowball effect. Once you have one idea in your head, 
you keep looking for things to confirm that one idea until you believe in it more and more and more until you're so far away from reality nothing you think makes any sense anymore, and it's 5% based on facts and observation. 95% based on completely made up headcanon and interpretations towards your preconceived biases. So yeah. Kaido is great. He's got other interesting aspects to him too, in a meta sense, he's a charming rendition of the trope of the bumbling hero. Like, a lot of his flaws, like I said, are similar to other characters in the same trope, but a lot of how the other characters perceive Kaido is incorrect, I guess similar to how the other characters fail to perceive Uma accurately. The other characters think of Kaido as brash, stupid, and, like, stealing Saihara's credit, when in reality, the joke is that most of these are small-minded misunderstandings. Kaido's philosophy makes sense in a bird's eye view of life, he's not naive. Kaido also isn't stupid. He's insanely talented as we can see in his FTEs and we can generally tell in the main game. There are certain details in the main game that I really appreciate with Kaido that are easy to overlook. Kaido assumes his role to try to support Saihara, but he's not unintelligent. He's not as good of a detective as Saihara, but he's better than most of the rest of the cast, he makes a bunch of completely valid and clever arguments and notices small things throughout the whole game. My favorite Kaido moment is in chapter 4 where he's a suspect and Uma's trying to push him away from Saihara to hurt their relationship and try to destroy Kaido's worldview and hurt his feelings and damage his friendship because you know, Uma is such a good boy, such a wholesome and praiseworthy hero. Obviously these are the actions and motivations of a precious cinnamon roll, right? Fucking morons. And in the process of this, Kaido gets logged out by Saihara using Miu's phone, and when he logs back in, unlike literally every other character in the entire Danganronpa series, Kaido says okay, you carry on, I'm going to go back over and finish investigating the chapel area myself. Kaido doesn't just leave it to Saihara, Kaido goes to fully investigate the scene Saihara already finished investigating so that he can have a better understanding of the scene and try to find something of value for the investigation. Kaido never lets other people do all the work, he always does a full investigation himself as well. This stands out to me because, like I said, we never see someone else in the series do this, except for the omnipotent characters like Kayaki who already know more than the protagonist. Kaido is just a character whose presence elevates beyond just being a person. He's a symbol, an icon. This again gives him another similarity with Uma. Like I've said in other videos about Uma, he's more fictional than he is a real person. He's an enigmatic, loose form. Uma exists for the sake of someone existing to fulfill his role, to be the rival of Danganronpa, to mess with the trials, to create conflict and drama and intrigue. He exists less as a person and more as an object to liven up the killing game, diegetically. In a similar sense, Kaido is also not exactly a normal real person. Kaido is an idea, he is a universal force. Just like Uma exists to serve his role in the plot, Kaido exists to affect and inspire the people around him. Neither of them exists just to be people. He'll never be in their lives forever, he'll always be moving one step beyond, leaving everything behind. This is an observation and analysis that has been made of Kamina by many fans of Gurren Lagan, and this story takes that concept and makes Kaido clearly exist as a symbol first, and a person second. Another major difference between Kamina and Kaido is that Kamina is immediately the most prominent character in Gurren Lagan basically being the primary protagonist for the first chunk of the show, until he dies, and inspires his younger brother to take the reins and become a man in his place. In that sense, Kamina is split between Kaed and Kaido, or Kaed is the Nia of the story. Kaed is the most prominent inspirational hero at the start that steps aside to inspire the weak protagonist to take his slash her place, and Kaido is just very obviously similar to Kamina in almost every way. Like, 
there are a bunch of other really clever reasons for why Kaido was made to be the astronaut who wants to reach space, it has a clever twist on the concept of SHSL talents, it provides an interesting exploration of why his personality makes sense for his talent. But it also obvious points a big finger to Kamina, a very famous character who used reckless abandon and natural charisma and leadership to try to reach space. The main differences are that we don't ever see Kaido as the true protagonist. It's interesting how the game toys with the perspective of who we see as the main character, with Kaido, the most prominent character in the group as the game goes on, with Kaed and Saihara, with Kibo, the audience surrogate for the TV show. Kaido even talks a few times about how he views himself as the protagonist, but he expects and urges other people to view themselves as the protagonists of their own stories. He does our protagonist perspective shift the way we look at these stories. The other main difference is that Simon doesn't grow any more confident in himself until after Kamina dies, and no other characters viewed. Simon as capable expert for Kamina until long after Kamina was gone, but in V3, Saihara starts getting recognition from the rest of the group as the game progresses before Kaido is gone, and we see their relationship affected by this in certain ways. Saihara and Kaido are just a classic dynamic. In fact, the trio between Saihara, Maki, and Kaido, is almost certainly meant to reflect Simon, Yoko, and Kamina. Their personalities and relationships and talents all match up too perfectly. Of course, Gurren Lagann is a series where, at least initially, rampant reckless heroism is positive and necessary to win in their ongoing war with the Beastmen. Reckless heroism is the only thing that can realistically improve their lives and fight back against their oppressors, they need to fight back. Of course, Gurren Lagann advances past this and makes a very compelling commentary on the importance of balance. Reckless forward progression is vital to improve people's lives and achieve things, but without an equal amount of personal responsibility, the world can fall into chaos and disarray. V3's use of Kaido especially clearly throws its own hat into this discussion ring. DR1 and DR2 are parodies that openly criticize the typical anime messaging of friendship is power, just believe in yourself and win the fight, etc., and it proves that you can't just fight serious dangerous problems with platitudes, and that just because you're a crazy anime character. Your insane nonsense talents and anime tropes won't give you plot armor that saved you from the logical consequences of your actions, or allow you to overcome a situation you logically can't fight in these means. There's a debate to be had here, pros and cons, complexities. It's not just Kaido's strengths that inspire people, Kaido's flaws allow other characters like Saihara to feel more at ease with him, to see themselves in him and realize that they don't have to be perfect in order to have the confidence and love of life that Kaido does. Kaido's flaws are just another way that he enriches the lives of others and helps them grow as people. Flaws are strengths, flaws are human. We shouldn't try to pretend like we're flawless or cower in fear of letting our flaws show, trying not to put ourselves in situations where we might fail or our flaws might come out. Kaido's reckless belief and pursuing his dreams and defending his pride, there are plenty of good and bad aspects to each of these traits, and it all comes down to existentialism, what do you value most? How do you live a life that faces death? As a final note, I just want to say on a personal level, that I love this type of character. I really love masculine characters. Truly masculine characters. My personal life philosophies stem from a bunch of differing views, I like Plato, Hume, Nietzsche, Pascal, Kant, a lot of the classics, and on a moral and existential level, I really believe in the importance of virtue. I think pride is a very important component of human worth. Pride exists in every aspect of philosophy. Why should you follow ethics or morals? Well, because you have pride in yourself, you have a large ego and you attempt to better yourself and live via your lofty expectations of yourself, your morality, your talents, your goals, etc. You need to have pride in yourself as a person to be a decent human being. 
all attributes, mentalities, they can all be flawed if you take them too far in any direction. The world itself is inherently flawed. Life is unfair. Even if every single human being on the planet was a perfect individual, as good as is physically possible for them to be, we would still run into conflicts and unfairness and problems, because we don't control the entire universe, and because for people to have free will, they have to be allowed to have conflict. Conflicting worldviews, beliefs, agendas, etc. I don't think the goal of a philosophy on life is to be perfect, I think the goal is to be as good as you can be while getting the most out of your life. You have to live as an example for others. You have to follow what you desire, your dreams, your wants and ambitions, do the things that make you happy and satisfied. If you don't do that, why should anyone else? And if no one does that, then is anyone in the world having fun with their lives anymore? If not, then what is the point of being a good person or helping humanity? It's like I talked about in my Gundham video talking about DR2 Trial 4. I fully believe that a certain level of selfishness is an absolute moral necessity. You must enrich your own life first and foremost. That is the goal of living. That is what gives the entire human race value in existing. I just really respect this kind of presentation, of taking a clearly flawed overly masculine character, the himbo character if you will, and showing how even though such a masculine self-perception and worldview leads to problems, above all else, they enrich their own lives. I feel like himbo is the optimal form of character, himbo is peak comedy, peak likability, and peak philosophical role model. Their lives are bright and beautiful and filled with value. They run into unfairness and injustices against them generated by life, and their flaws generate some minor injustices for others. Injustices are a part of living, but if every single person lived like these people, everything would be so much better and more fulfilling for everyone. Kaido is not the perfect ideal person, but he is the embodiment of what we could all use more of in our lives. He's the one who can open our eyes when we're too naive, too cautious, when we miss the bigger picture in a life that faces death. Just like in Gurin Lagan, Kaido is only part of the equation. We need Kaido's spirit to tackle a life that faces death, but we also have to stop, look around, and ask why. Because the hero of the story isn't Kaido, it's Saihara, who doesn't generate any of these ideas on his own. Saihara just thinks. He observes the people around him, understands their philosophical value, how they contribute to the meaning of life, Saihara stops and asks why. Saihara's ultimate detective talent is much less about his ability to solve murder cases. And much more about his ability to see the world as it truly is. Saihara can see things not just literary, he can see the essence. If you compare Saihara's internal thoughts and his vague philosophical musings like how he tries to explain to Maki what it is that Saihara thinks makes Kaido worth looking up to, we can see how much more Saihara is a detective of philosophy than any other protagonist or character in the series. Saihara is the one who understand the meta. In a meta interpretation, we could see this as, Saihara is such a good detective that he understands the world on a meta level because he reads into the fact that their world is a fictional story. Either way, Saihara collects worldviews, opinions, metaphorical meaning, deeper purpose. Saihara collects and collects and collects throughout the whole game until by the end, he's incorporated so much of Kaido and Uma and Kaed, and every other character that died along the way, and he's become the most black-pilled motherfucker on the face of the planet. Saihara is able to deduce the truth of existence itself, of life, of love. We need people like Kaido to show us all of these incredible things, but we need to be like Saihara in order to learn all we can from Kaido's philosophical value. We need to understand our existentialism with honesty and truth. Saihara also states in Trial 6 that it is because he is weak that he was able to realize his profound truth. Kaido and Uma had philosophical value, 
but their toxic masculinity and hostility led them to be unable to clearly observe the truths of each other. Sihara has no ego attached to what he thinks is true, so he is able to purely seek the truth. I love all these characters, I'm a big fan Kaido's archetype, the whole trio's archetypes. Most people are big fans of these archetypes, which is probably why they're in V3, the game about using popular tropes. Out of all the archetypes Danganronpa has used in the series, I think this one is probably the most popular and well-liked. I think that's why the trio between Saihara, Kaido, and Maki is played fairly straight. It doesn't deviate from the archetype drastically like most other DR trope deconstruct ions. It's simple and we've seen in before, but it's just really enjoyable when well done. Anyways, that's all from me today. See ya.